Well, I'm thrilled to be here today. I really am, and this is a good crowd. We had a good group. Had more for the morning service than I thought we would. But anyway, uh, you know, today there are people that are living all over this world, older than I am, that have never had a Bible to read. They've never had a preacher, a gospel preacher, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. They have never heard one of the hymns of the faith that we take for granted every day. They do not have a church. They've never been to church and probably wouldn't know what you meant if you talked to them about a church. You know, it was Oswald Smith that said, we in America and Canada are talking about the coming of the Lord. How many of y'all are looking for the Lord to come? Raise your hand right there. Man, I am too. I'll tell you, it wouldn't bother me if he interrupted my sermon. I'd rather hear him near me anyway. But anyway, uh, Oswald J. Smith said that we're, we're talking about the second coming of Christ when nearly half of the world has never heard of his first coming. Now, I can't hardly comprehend that. It's hard for me to comprehend that. And uh, it's hard to comprehend that counter. A while ago, nearly 9,000 people have died in the last less than two hours in this world, most of them without God and without hope. Well, I'm glad you're here this morning, and we'll try to challenge you a little bit about missions today. And uh, we're always trying to get Christians to get involved, and we ought to do that. And uh, we gotta, we got to surrender to go. Somebody's got to go, amen? At a church this size, I can't imagine there's not some men and women here that would be willing to go, want to go, and God wants you to go. But you've got to be listening. got to be listening to His voice. But we've got to have some that will surrender. Then we've got to have a church like this one, which does do that, praise the Lord, to send and sustain those missionaries not only in finances. You know, we usually promise missionaries two things. Well, we're going to pray for you, and we're going to give you so much money a month. We do pretty good on the money part. We're pretty faithful on that. But I wonder how faithful we are on the praying part. Amen. And I believe that's really the lifeline of everything. Well, we talk so much about our responsibility and what our heart ought to be like. I want to preach to you this morning what the heart of God is like when it comes to world evangelism. And I want you to turn to the last book in the Bible. You know, they say that... A person's last words are usually very important. I've been with, uh, as the old pastor has, I've been with a lot of people when they were dying, and those that were able to talk, their last words were not usually very frivolous, they were very serious. And I want us to look at some of the last words of God in the last chapter of the last book of the Bible. The first book of the Bible tells us how everything got started, how God created I love creation. I, I, I love hearing uh, Dr. Uh, the dentist, brother, uh, yeah, yeah. I love to hear him pray. Every time he prays, he's thanking God for the creation. And, uh, but anyway, Dr. Sheehan, excuse me, Dr. Sheehan, I prayed with him last night and getting him to remember his name today. That what, that's what happens to you when you get my age, amen. But anyway, the first book of the Bible tells us how everything began and uh, the second book, of the last book of the Bible tells us how everything is going to end. And uh, we're going to look at the last chapter because we're going to find some of the last words of God in this last chapter. You know, Revelation is a book about judgment. It is a book about angels. It's a book about, but it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about is Jesus. But in that judgment, there's a lot about earthquakes and pestilence. We think that the COVID virus is bad. We don't, we don't know anything of what's going to happen during the tribulation period. And there are creatures that will go across the earth that are unbelievable in their description. Half of the population of the world will die in those seven years. If that happened today, we're not talking about several hundred thousand. We're talking about almost four billion people will die. All of the prophecies of the Old Testament prophets that have not already been fulfilled will dovetail right into the book of Revelation. And all of those prophecies will be fulfilled. And we see the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bold judgments. And there are to be two things that God will be doing in these last days of the book of the Revelation. He will be restoring his nation. It will be called the time of Jacob's trouble. But God will be restoring them. But I'm going to tell you something else God's going to be doing. He's going to be vindicating his son. And there's going to be great judgment on this world. Don't think you can crucify God's Son and nothing, no consequences to it. The last time, I told the early morning service, the last time the world 
saw Jesus. He was hanging on a cross. He was bloody. His bones were out of joint. His back was shredded by the cat of nine tails. His beard was plucked from his face. And he was breathless, for he had given up the ghost and died. But I want you to know that the next time this old world sees him, he won't look nothing like that. Amen. Amen. Brother, he's not coming to hang on a cross. He's coming back to sit on a throne. Amen. Brother, when he comes back, he's coming back on a great white stallion. I'm going to be coming back on a little white pony and because uh, I can't ride a big horse. Amen. So anyway, I'm coming back with him. And if you're saved, you'll be coming back with him as well. He'll be wearing a crown, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Brother, he'll have a sword coming out of his mouth, and he won't be coming back as the meek Savior. He's going to be coming back as the mighty king. Amen? And I'm looking forward to being a part of that, setting up his kingdom. Though he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, God says, but the Father has also highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, I'm glad the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of God's dear Son. Amen. Amen. Well, when we go to the last book, I tell you, I was reading this, and it just got a hold of my soul, and it revealed to me, and I hope it does to you, the heart of God. Now, how many of you believe that we ought to love the things that God loves? Well, let's see in this passage what God loves. Amen? And I'm glad that God's a God of love. But that's only one side to the coin, and we're going to be preaching on the other side of the coin tonight. And I'm so burdened about it. I have been for weeks. But we see in this passage references to the coming of the Lord. Look at verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Verse 12. And behold, I come quickly. Verse 20. And he which testifieth these things said, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. And when the Lord Jesus comes, He's coming quickly. He's coming suddenly. And it's going to take this old world by surprise. So here we have our Bible. I believe the King James Bible for the English-speaking people. Amen? I believe that with all of my heart to the depths of my soul. And I will die that way and be right to lay a Bible in my casket with me and make sure it's the King James. Amen? But anyway, I'm glad for that. It took some 1,500 years for God to give us the whole Bible. He used 40-some authors. It was written under inspiration of God on three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. And I'm thankful for the Bible, 1,500 years in completion. And now John, the revelator on the Isle of Patmos, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is, is penning the last words of of God in the Bible. Now, if I was God and you were God, what would you say? I mean, you've said a whole lot in 66 books of the Bible. You've said a lot. But what are you going to say as you close out the Bible? And I can almost see old John writing this book under inspiration. He knows it's of God. And he's got his pen in his hand. And he's thinking, well, we've just about concluded. And he thinks maybe it's time to lay his pen down. And God said, don't lay your pen down yet. There's one more thing I want to say to the people of this world. Just one more thing. What would it be that God would say, the last thing He would say to the people of this world? Don't do it. I've got one more invitation to give. Look at one verse of Scripture this morning. Verse number 17. The Bible says, and the Spirit, and that's speaking of the Spirit of God, and the Spirit and the Bride, the Bride is speaking of the church of our Lord Jesus, is speaking of Woodland Baptist Church and the peoples of God who know the Lord. So the Spirit and the Bride say, come. I want you to take your pen and as I read this one verse, just one verse, circle every time the word come is used, C-O-M-E. So the Spirit and the Bride say, come. Let him that hears say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. Isn't that amazing? Three times in one little verse, God repeated it over and over. And whosoever, whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. God's final invitation to mankind. 
The last words of our God. Can you, can you sense what I'm trying to say to you? That all through these 1,500 years, God has told man so many things. But when he comes right down to the end and the revelation is getting ready to be closed and he even warns in the next verses, don't add anything to this and don't take anything away from it. But the God of heaven has one more thing to say before he closes out his Bible after 1,500 years. And he says, I want people to come to me. I invite people to come to me. Holy Spirit, invite people to come to me. Church, invite people to come to me. I want people to come to me. You know, God in the beginning, in that first book of the Bible, just before the great judgment of the flood, gave an invitation to Noah and to anybody else that wanted to come. But God was inside of the ark and said, Come, for things are ready. Come on in. God is being, has been saying that, has been inviting people to come to Him down through the centuries and down through the decades. And you can't go anywhere in this world, not anywhere in this world, and find one person that God doesn't love. I had a missionary one time when I was in Bible college. His son was a friend of mine, and his dad was on the mission field, and this boy grew up on the mission field. And his dad came one time, and I said, Well, I guess you've been telling people God loves them. He said, No, I can't do that, son. I'm talking about a missionary. I said, Sir, why is that? I mean, I'm just a young preacher boy. He's a, he's a veteran. He said, Well, I'm afraid I'd tell the wrong one. Because, see, I don't believe God loves everybody. I determined that day in that conversation, brother, I would never repeat words like he said because I would never believe what he believed. Brother, I believe that Jesus tasted death for every man. Brother, he died. He died for every person. Listen, I don't have a Calvinistic bone in my body. And brother, Calvinism is what emptied out, one of the things that emptied out the churches of Europe. And it'll empty this church if it ever gets in here. Now, God help us, amen. I want to give you three things here, and I, I want us to see that the last, the last words of our great God is an invitation for people to be saved. Now, we get the idea He's only inviting people here at Woodland, and by the way, thank God He is. I'm glad He invited me when I was in a little apartment building uh, in Newport News, Virginia. I'm glad that God cares about people, but I'm telling you, He's inviting people to come to Him in every corner of this earth. He is in the cold region of Iceland. He is in Paraguay, South America this morning. He is in Kenya, Africa this morning, Zambia. I'm telling you, Europe, Russia, China, everywhere there is, God wants people to come to Him. He doesn't want people to be a statistic. He wants people to be His child, to be a a born-again Christian, to spend eternity. Do you think God made people just so He can cast them into hell? I don't believe it for a second. But I believe we've chosen to go our own way. And there's consequences to that. Let me give you quick, three quick things, if I could, from this one verse of Scripture. By the way, I want you to notice another little phrase here that's used three times. Circle this one. Let him. You see that after the first come? Let him that heareth come. Let him that is a thirst come. Whosoever will, let him. Brother, God wants people to come to him. He wants us to come. So I look, first of all, at God's great burden, God's greatest burden. You say, well, it looks like God's greatest burden is kind of keep this universe going. God created the world, and, you know, Jesus sustains it, and it'd fly apart if He didn't. But God's greatest burden is kind of keep things going. Let me tell you something, my friend. Creation is a wonderful thing. I love creation. I love reading about it. I put on a, I put on a, a song on the, in my car on the way over here early this morning. And I googled, how great thou art. I love that song. God's a great God. Amen. And He loves us and gave His Son for us. But anyway, it's not creation. God's greatest burden is the lost souls of this community and of North Carolina and of the United States and of every continent in the whole wide world. That's God's burden. Now, I would think if you say that we ought to love what God loves, we ought to have similar burdens that God has. Amen. I'm glad God was burdened for me. I don't know why He would be burdened for me, except that He is a God of love, and I thank Him for that. But there's nothing so great as getting sinners saved in this world. Do you realize that was the purpose that God raised up Israel? I'm sure there were more purposes, but in Isaiah I find it two times mentioned. 
Why did God call them His chosen people? Because God chose them to be a light and a witness to the Gentiles of this world. You know why, you know why He's got the church? So we can go into all the world and preach the gospel. We get the idea it's all about us. Well, I'm glad God saved me. Now I can, I can tell others. I can invite others to, to come. In fact, the Bible said God's greatest burden. The Spirit of the Lord works to get people to come. I said this morning, salvation is not taught. Well, I, I, can't, I can't witness, preacher, because I don't have the gift of gab. Well, thank God you don't. Amen? Well, I just, I've never, I've ne I don't know that I have the gift of soul winning. It's not a gift. It's a command. And God commands us to be a witness and invite people just to come to Jesus. Now, the Holy Spirit supernaturally will work in that person's heart if you'll give them the gospel. And we've got to know what the gospel is if we're going to give people the gospel. Amen? I was having a guy asked me one time, he said, Are you a full gospel church down there where you pastor? I said, Yes, sir. He said, You're a full gospel church? I said, Full as you can get. He said, You mean to tell me you were, I thought you were a Baptist? I said, I am. Well, I thought, Are you a full gospel church? I said, yes, sir. He said, you mean to tell me y'all speak in tongues and roll in the floor? And he started naming off these things. I said, I don't have a thing to do with the gospel. You asked me if I was a gospel church, a full gospel church. I said, we're as full as you can get, death, burial, and resurrection. And brother, if you'll preach that, if you'll witness that, if you'll tell people that, and then after telling them that, invite them to come. The Spirit of God will use that. See, I believe every time the preacher stands up or the soul winner goes out on visitation and you're sharing the gospel, brother, I believe that the Holy Spirit of God is right into that. Amen? And He's wooing those people and dealing. And I know there's some hard cases, but there's no case too hard for God. Amen? I've seen some hardened people get saved that I'll be honest with you, just thinking fleshly, never would get saved, became some of the greatest Christians I've ever known. When the Holy Spirit, when a preacher preaches from the pages of this book, the Holy Spirit is speaking through those words. And He does it through our witness as well. You see, salvation is a supernatural work of God. And God is not willing that any should perish. And I don't care where they live. And I don't care where they look like. And I don't care if we don't like them. God, God loves them. And God wants us to love who He loves. Amen. So not only does the Spirit of God, and God's greatest burden is shown here. He wants people to be saved. But now what about the church? The bride says come. Because you see, the Holy Spirit works through His church. And we, the bride, the bride of Christ, Ephesians 5 teaches us that. Jesus is the bridegroom. We are the bride. He wants us to invite people to come. So you have here the Spirit and the bride say come. So not only God's greatest burden, but the church's greatest business is inviting people to come to Jesus. God made that complicated, didn't he? Well, what is the church supposed to do? I, I hear folks saying, well, we had a meeting around the table with the, with the deacons and the elders and whoever and all this stuff, and why, I, I, we're, we're trying to find out what God's, what God's plan is for us. I said, have you ever read the book of Acts? I said, it's called the Great Commission, and if you don't understand it, read the book of Acts and it'll tell you. But I don't have to sit around a table and try to figure out the purpose of God's church. Brother, he's put it right in the Bible. We're to invite people to come to Jesus. That's what our purpose is all about. And we have to do it in our own Jerusalem here, but we can't stop here. I asked the morning group, what are you doing? What? Listen, I have to answer the same questions. Listen, I'm probably sorry than most Christians in here, but let me tell you, what one thing, just give me one, what one thing do you do on a regular basis, say every week, for worldwide evangelism. Just one thing. And I'm not being pious when I say this. But I come back home last night from a prayer meeting. And I come back in, I looked in my pocket, and I had that track that I'd been carrying all day from the track of Woodland Baptist. And I'll be honest with you, it shamed me. You mean you stuffed that in your pocket and left it there all day? And you hadn't given it to anybody? Wouldn't it be wonderful to say, I'm going to ask God to help me every day of my life to invite one person at least to come to Jesus. 
Hey, the Spirit says come, and the bride, the church, and we're the church, it says come. Our responsibility is to invite people to the Lord. It's the most important function the church does. We need to start in our home, amen? We need to talk to our little children. You know, children can be saved. You know, if you'll read some of the biographies of some of the great preachers of the past, some of the great missionaries of the past, a lot of them got saved five, six, seven, eight, nine years old. It's amazing. It's amazing. In fact, uh, I'm trying to think of the missionary's name. It won't come to me right now. I told the preacher, I said, when you get my age, your mind don't work quite right. It's like a marble. It rolls around. And after a while, it'll come out. But if you have to wait for it to roll long, you have to move on. Amen. But anyway, he got saved at five years old, and the church fired the pastor, his pastor, because his pastor led him to the Lord, and they didn't believe anybody would get saved that young. And he went on to be Moffat. Moffat. He, he, went, he, he went on to be one of the greatest missionaries of Africa. Five years old. Isn't that amazing? Amazing. But we've got to give out gospel tracts. We've got to do all these things. Why? Because God commands us to. And the Holy Spirit will enable you and help you. When He, the Holy Spirit, has come, what's He going to do? He's going to give you power. To do what, preacher? He makes it plain in verse 8 of chapter 1 of Acts. I'm going to give you power to be a witness. You mean, God, you're going to help me to be a witness? If, listen, if I was God and I had a son who was willing to die for a bunch of sinners and I wanted the word to get out about my son, I believe I'd help those who were willing to give it out. He said, I'll give you power that you'll be witnesses. And he even tells us where to be a witness at. <laughs> right here where we are in our Jerusalem and Samaria and Judea and all the way to the uttermost parts of the world. How are you going to go to the uttermost parts of the world? Well, some of you ought to surrender and go. I mean, listen to the voice of God. I'm a, I, see, I don't believe that God's quit calling. I believe we've quit listening. Well, that's a, one of the burdens of my heart. I was thinking about preaching tonight a message I've entitled Burning Plows and Eating Cows. And it's out of the Old Testament, right out of the book. I, I'm not stretching the title, but I'm not going to preach that tonight. But anyway, maybe the Lord will let me preach again. If I don't do too bad today, the preacher might let me come back again. <laughs> Amen. Did you know few people, some do now, some because they're just searching, but you know few people come to church when they're lost unless they're invited. Now Christians many times search in a church or whatever may come, but most lost people will never come to a church unless somebody asks them to come. Come. We've got a good preacher. We got a good church, but greater than that, we got a good Savior. What a Savior. What a Savior we have. Let's tell people about Him. Amen. And then, last of all, and I close with this not only God's greatest burden is to see people saved, not only is it the church's greatest business, but it's mankind's greatest blessing. Did you notice in verse number 17? And let him that hears say come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will. I love those words. That, that included me. So you don't know me. I don't know you. I mean, I know you, but you don't know my heart. You don't know my past. I don't know your past. I don't know your heart. God does, and he still saved me. Isn't that wonderful? Let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Now, there's two things here I believe that are important as we think about people coming to the Lord. Number one, there needs to be a desire. Now, the Holy Spirit will give them that desire. They can push it aside. They can, they can reject it. They can do those things. But brother, as you and I give out the, you know, the simple gospel is given by simple people, but it's under the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what makes it supernatural. It's not just me talking somebody into it. I've talked a few into it. And they didn't last five seconds. And they drunk the same liquor the next week they drunk before. No change ever in their life. But I'm telling you, brother, don't think that people won't get saved if we tell them. Here's the problem. And I raise my hand in shame. We're not telling them. We're not asking them to come. Mankind's greatest blessing. You've got to have a desire to come. Did you notice that phrase there? Let him that is a thirst come. What were you coming for? This water of life? Brother, if you're thirsty 
and there's water available, it would be an insane person to say, I'm so thirsty, my throat's so dry, I'm parched. I, 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 used, to, I used to work in the field. My daddy did truck farming, and uh, we raised all kinds of vegetables and stuff, acres and acres of them. We had so many tomatoes, I said, I wasn't even saved, and I said this. I said, Lord, if you let me ever get away from home, I won't ever eat another tomato. But anyway, we'd be out in the field working hot, and we young boys, we wouldn't take any water with us. We thought we were pretty tough, you know. And brother, we could we get so thirsty, we couldn't stand it. And then there come my daddy. My daddy was a man that walked on crutches, so he couldn't work in the field with us. But there he come on that truck. And man, the dust would be flying up behind that truck, and I knew exactly what he had, because it was about 1030. And I knew exactly what he had. He had an RC cola and a moon pie. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen for that. That's preaching right there now. That's preaching right there. And I'm telling you, the first thing I grabbed was not the moon pie. You know why? I was thirsty. I wanted something. And there are people in this world that are searching. They want something. They may not even know what it is. When you tell them, they may not even think that's it. But they're thirsty. You see, God puts something in people. And the Spirit of God is at work when you and I don't know whether... We don't know what the Spirit of God is doing except we know He uses the Word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So people are thirsty. They, they want to know something. They want to believe something. Listen, this whole world is in crisis today. I mean, it's all over the world. The last days, the Bible said, will be characterized by perilous times. Look up the word perilous in an old Strong's Concordance. It means lawlessness. Have you ever seen a day of such lawlessness? All over the world, really. So first of all, there has to be a desire. There's thirst. Second of all, you have to make a decision. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, you say, preacher, is it, is it, is it that easy to believe to have a repentant attitude about my sin and believe and come to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I want to decide for you. I, I want, do you want God to make it hard? Sometimes we preachers complicate it for people. Sometimes soul winners call. But let me tell you, God's made it simple. Come. <laughs> and what did Jesus say? He that cometh to me, I'll in no wise cast him out. So, brother, if you'll just get there, amen, if you'll just come. Make a decision because it says the will, whosoever will. It's an act of your will. You've got to make a decision. And it's a decision you make by faith. For by grace are we saved through faith. It is not of ourself. It is the gift of God. And let me tell you, God will never force you to be saved. There's not enough angels that can push you into heaven. But neither can anybody keep you from being saved. And there's not enough demons of hell that can keep you from getting into the gates of heaven one day. But it is your decision. And God has made us that way, you know. You know, there's some groups of people who say we don't really have a will in the matter. Well, they're not reading the Bible I'm reading. They're reading some theology book by some guy. What they need to do is get back to the Bible, just read the Bible, amen? But brother, I'm going to tell you, when, when God says, you, I've created you with a free will, do you think that God said, Adam, now here's what I don't want you to do, son. I, I don't know how many trees are in the garden, maybe a hundred, maybe a thousand, I don't know. But there's only one you can't eat of. You can have the rest of them. It's kind of like when you see a thing, don't touch it, it's got paint, wet paint. You've got to touch it, you know, you just have to touch it. Anyway, God told him not to take the tree, of the fruit of the tree. Told him not to do that. Do you think that God made him do it? And then turned around and punished him for something God made him do? I read a man that believed that, and I thought, boy, what a nut he is. Amen. God's greatest burden, church's greatest business, mankind's greatest blessing. The heart of God is revealed in this last chapter, boy. It's revealed in other places. But the last chapter and the last words... I mean, right at the very end, before he laid down that pen of inspiration, hold it, don't, don't lay that down, we're not quite through. I want to give my people, I want to give my creatures, I want to give mankind one more invitation. Man, isn't God a good God? 
Brother, Jesus is coming. And whatever we do, we better do while it's day. For the night cometh when no man can work. It may be an uncle. It may be your grandma. Teenagers, you've got grandmama. Some of them are not saved. And you know, you could probably be used by God maybe better and easier than anybody else because you know what grandmas do? They love their grandchildren. <laughs> you know what grandpas do? They love their grandchildren. What an opportunity it is for us. But we've got to really believe it's serious. And the time's drawing near, and I believe we are living. I believe Jesus is coming. I told the morning uh, service, and I'll be through right on time today, but uh, there was a lady who worked in a children's home in Kentucky. I don't know the name of the, the, the home. This lady was given a testimony. She said, we have small, most of them are smaller, but some of them are a little older. But most of them, you know, young and so forth, fairly young. And said, we, we work with uh, mentally challenged children. And she said, preacher, I tell you, they will amaze you. They will amaze you, some of them, what they do, what they, their hearts are so tender. And she said, we teach them the Bible. And said, boy, she said, I remember that week we decided we were going to teach them on the coming of Jesus. And we told those boys and girls about Jesus coming back. That he'd already been one time and he'd gone to an old rugged cross and he died for our sins. And boys and girls, he died for your sins too. But you know what? He's coming back. And those who have believed on him and received him, he's going to come back and take us out of here. Amen? I'm looking for that being taken out of here part, don't you? And she said, we taught them boys and girls about Jesus coming back. And she said, preacher, she said, almost every one of them believed it with all their heart. And uh, I said, how do you know they believed it with all their heart? She said, preacher, for the next week, she said, we were so busy cleaning the window panes on the front of the home that looked out to the path that came up to the home. And we would find little children with their face right against the glass with their hands on it. Hey, don't be messing up the glass, honey. Well, after we found out what they were doing, we didn't say anything to them. But they were looking for Jesus to come. And they thought, well, if he's coming, he's coming like everybody else that comes here right down that little road that comes to our home. Wouldn't it be good if we had that kind of faith, the reality that Jesus is coming? And as we put our hands and our face to the glass, we'll realize our responsibility, the greatest business of the church, is invite people to come. I'm inviting you to come this morning if you're not saved. I'm inviting you to come if you have a desire, if you're willing to make a decision for Christ. You may not understand all about it. My goodness, the night I got saved, I didn't understand everything. I wasn't a Bible scholar. I, I, I didn't, listen, it was three weeks before I found out the Holy Spirit came inside of me and indwelt me when I got saved. I went around three weeks not even knowing that. Now I've gone all these 40-some years and still off us, I don't know. But invite, Jesus is inviting you to come this morning. Let's bow and pray.